The League of Women Voters of Cupertino Sunnyvale presents Election Pros and Cons, Cupertino Measures C and D, live from the Cupertino Community Hall. And now for tonight's moderator, Susan Huff. Good evening. Welcome back. We're here now for the Cupertino measure analysis. Those of you who have wandered out into the lobby after part one of this program can wander back in quietly if you like. Um, a brief repeat, we're here from the League of Women Voters of Cupertino and Sunnyvale, doing our level best to give you an unbiased analysis of the measures, not to tell you how to vote on them, but to tell you to please understand them as well as you can before voting on them. We based our analysis on publicly available sources. Various campaigns have offered us access to other information in, I think, every case it was material that had already been found publicly available. So you can do the same research that we did, if you choose. And Cupertino has two on. Again, we'll work in alphabetical order, although this time I will not take questions until after both of them because they are a bit intertwined, these two. So measure C and measure D. Also at the end, we'll discuss the intersections because it can get complicated when you have competing measures. Starting with measure C itself, called the Cupertino Citizen Sensible Growth Initiative, that's a few too many syllables for me to say many times in a row. I trust you'll bear with me if I keep calling it Measure C. So what does it do? This slide was prepped really thinking about the Valco area. And what, it, what Measure C does at Valco is it removes residential and office development, that is two million square feet of office space that's currently allocated in the general plan, allowing only retail, hotel, dining, and entertainment uses in Valco. It would eliminate the 389 residential units presently allocated to Valco, and it would maintain, as a firm figure, the current $1.2 million square feet of commercial retail at Valco. It would also limit the maximum height of any new development at Valco to 45 feet. That's lower than some of the existing buildings. They could stay, but any, any new buildings would need to be down at uh, 45 feet. Measure C would also generally modify the general plan. And a question came in just today saying, Please don't talk just about Valco. Please look, talk about the rest of the general plan. So thank you for that little nudge. Because it does have some effects well outside the, the Valco bit. So generally prohibiting increases in maximum building heights, densities, lot coverage, or building planes citywide, and prohibiting decreases in minimum setback requirements set by the general plan. It would add new policies regarding development and building standards, including setbacks, stepbacks, building plans, and rooftop height extensions, and reduce the residential allocation by 146 units. Um, only the voters would be able to change those general plan amendments adopted by Measure C. Now, one of the more contentious bits is this next bullet point that we reach. Um, which says increases building height from 30 feet to 45 feet in the neighborhoods. This has been the subject of considerable argument. It gets its very own slide in this presentation. So we'll cover that in more detail later. And yes, all the changes in C would need to return to the voters um, if they were to, if, if the voters vote them in these changes into the general plan, it would be only the voters who could remove them. So on the building height, it increases the maximum height in the general plan from 30 to 45 feet in the city's neighborhoods. This covers parts of the city that are outside the city's special areas. About one fourth of the neighborhoods set their maximum height by direct reference to the general plan. So if the general plan changes, the maximum height in those neighborhoods changes immediately. About three fourths of the neighborhoods are zoned. 
And if the maximum height is set by the zoning, that might still be whatever the zoning says, except that Measure C also includes a conforming clause that says the city's zoning ordinances must be changed to conform with C within six months. So that could require those zonings to change to match Measure C. What happened, this did go to court. So what happened in the court? The city, the city council, modified the ballot measure language to state that it would increase the maximum building heights in neighborhoods to 45 feet. Pa proponents of C passionately opposed the language change. At a court hearing, an attorney for the initiative proponents argued that the initiative does not raise building heights in neighborhoods because neighborhoods are special areas. An attorney representing the city argued that neighborhoods are separate from special areas and therefore whether intentionally or unintentionally the initiative does increase maximum building heights in the neighborhoods. The Santa Clara County judge ruled the ballot language adopted by the city was factually correct. And Santa Clara County Superior Court filed a notice that the court denied the writ of mandate. That's an appeal. So the decision affirms that the initiative, if approved by voters, would increase the general plan maximum building height in neighborhoods from 30 feet to 45 feet. And as we said, now we get to that zoning question. If the general plan goes from 30 to 45, those one-fourth of neighborhood areas that set heights by direct reference to the general plan those would immediately be affected by the passage of Measure C. The three quarters of neighborhoods that set maximum heights by zoning requirements may be affected by this portion of the Measure C text. It says this initiative shall become effective immediately upon the certification of election results within six months of the effective date of this measure, all provisions of the municipal cord, uh, code ordinances, including zoning ordinances, shall be revised and amended to make them conform with the provisions of this initiative. So that's a little ambiguous, but it could be construed to mean that those would also need to go to 45. It also says that until such time as the ordinances of, and plans have been so revised and amended, the provisions of this initiative shall prevail over any conflicting provisions. The people in favor of C um, would like to direct you to ccsensiblegrowth.org and to bettercupertino.org. They would like you to know that it gives voters the opportunity to reject growth in Cupertino, that it retains the Valco Shopping District primarily as a retail, hotel, dining, and entertainment venue and rejects its designation as an office park, that it helps prevent further school overcrowding and traffic congestion, and that it requires voter approval for certain changes to the general plan. People opposed, Sand Hill Property Company, the Valco developer, Judy Wilson, Richard Lowenthal, Hung Wei, I regret that I cannot pronounce the next name, uh, and Keith Warner would like to direct you to revitalizevalco.com and cupertinomeasurec.com. They would like you to know that it changes the general plan to increase the height limit in neighborhoods to 45 feet, that it prevents office and residential use in Valco. And these next two bullets are with reference to the Measure D plans for Valco. They say it, Measure C blocks millions of dollars in one-time revenue for schools and transportation improvements and prevents the creation of a 30-acre park and that it requires an election to approve changes to developments in our city. Now, as we've already said, C and D have a lot to do with each other. We're going to continue straight on into D and then consider the combination of the two. What is D? D is the Valco Town Center Specific Plan Initiative. D arises because while the developer, Sandhill, was negotiating with the city, Measure C came up. The developer opted then to come directly to the voters rather than risk passage of Measure C, stopping its negotiations with the city. Measure D would replace a development agreement with the city of Cupertino being, in some sense, a direct development agreement with the voters of Cupertino. So what is D? 
D would establish permitted land uses for the Valco area, including 389 units of residential up to approximately 800 if there is a conditional use permit. Two million square feet of office space, a minimum of, of 100,000 square feet of that for incubator, co-work, or multi-tenant space. 640,000 square feet of commercial, minimum of 600,000 square feet of retail, entertainment, personal services, perhaps up to 40,000 square feet fitness. 339 hotel rooms, 148 of those have already been approved by the city. Minimum of 50,000 square feet of public or civic space, which could be increased to 100,000 if office space is reduced. Open space in parks, the 30 acre green roof that is kind of the signature detail of this particular plan, accessible to the public with at least 3.8 miles of public trails and two town squares comprising at least three acres. It also, D would also require the developer to provide certain enumerated community benefits and environmental design features, including approximately $40 million in facilities and programs for local schools, as provided in donation agreements between the developer and school districts. Approximately $30 million toward transportation improvements for the I-280 Wolf Road interchange and other freeway segments. $6 million for a bike pedestrian trail along 280, Additional off-site roadway, bicycle, and pedestrian improvements, a portion of funding for a community effort towards a free community shuttle, that would be in partnership with other agencies, the aforementioned green roof and town squares, senior housing, a minimum of 80 units or 20% of all units, whichever is greater, community banquet, event hall, hub building, amphitheater, playground, charitable leases for civic space, and extension of the recycled water pipeline. And like C, it would require voter approval of changes, although unlike C, there is an, an expiration date on that. It would require a voter approval of any changes made prior to the 1st of January, 2027. The people in favor of D are very much the same list as the people against C. And they say D is consistent with Cupertino's general plan. It offers a 30-acre community park. It offers a destination town center. It offers free space for nonprofits, $40 million in one-time revenue for schools, new homes for local seniors, and it provides funds to minimize the traffic impact. The people opposed to D are the people in favor of C. And they say, this replaces the mall with an office park, limited retail, and housing. It significantly increases daily commuter traffic on local streets and highways. It'll result in more workers competing for insufficient housing. There will be insufficient vehicle parking, bike paths, and bike parking. And it doesn't require a development agreement with the city of Cupertino. So OK, what happens with these two? Here's where we just have to put up the grid. If they both pass, they are sufficiently in conflict with each other that only the measure that passes with the greatest number of affirmative votes will actually pass. The other one, it will act as if it failed. If C passes and D fails, neighborhood heights will increase to 45 feet. Valco current use will stay largely as it is now. If D passes and C fails, Neighborhood height limit unchanged, Valco becomes multi-use. If both C and D fail, either group can try again using the initiative process or working with the Cupertino City Council. I see a couple of people taking pictures of that one. Good plan. If you want to do some of the same digging that we did, the measures and the city's analysis are available at cupertino.org. I might leave that up for a little while because I'm going to start digging out the questions. We did have some in advance. One of them says, what about Measure D and parking? I've been told that Measure D does not provide adequate parking. If we look at the city's municipal code for mixed use projects, the specific plan would be required to provide 10,413 vehicle parking spaces for that development. 
Under the municipal code, reduced parking could be allowed if supported by a parking study. Measure D proposes 9,060 parking spaces. So the proposed parking for that specific plan would not meet the city's parking standards for mixed use development, could meet an alternative parking standard if it were supported by a detailed parking study. You know, presumably if that looks at the efforts toward transportation, mass transit and bicycle and pedestrian and concludes that it is adequate, that would be a different question. Um, other question that came in in advance, who would have responsibility for maintaining that 30 acre park? That is a responsibility of the developer. Why are C and D both on the ballot? C is on because a group of concerned citizens wanted the citizens of Cupertino to have a voice on growth. D is on because the developer was concerned that C would pass while they were in conversation with the city council around their development of Valco. One question came in earlier. My home is zoned R1. The zoning code has a limit of at most 28 feet in height, two stories, other limits. The 28 feet in height already conforms to the general plan. Would I be able to build a four-story home if Measure C passes? I do not know whether R1 is one of those that sets the height by direct reference to the general plan or in its zoning. It sounds from this description as though it's in the zoning in which case you're in the ambiguous zone <laughs> that we already described. You have more. Serge, is this your handwriting? <laughs> um, in that case, whoever's trying to offer me a correction, uh, we stand by our analysis. Um, question, does Measure C allow future projects to skip environmental impact reports? And my research team has scribbled C state law on this. <laughs> Does Measure C limit office or residential allocation besides Valco? No. If C passes, the City Council can approve and still zone Valco as a revised plan and voters can approve it, right, is the question. If C passes, it replaces the general plan for that area and voters must write and approve any changes, must vote and approve any changes that are in Measure C. Okay, um, another question on the court rulings. The, the court ruled 45 feet in a quarter of the neighborhoods and with possible effect in the other three quarters. For areas with a 30 foot height limit in a zoning code, does 30 feet already conform to a limit of 45 feet? Good question, that's why it's ambiguous. Okay, my Cupertino Union School District school is experiencing declining enrollment. How would measures C and D impact CUSD schools that are under enrolled? Um, we don't have that information, unfortunately. I'm really grateful for my research team, which is scribbling answers on these almost as fast as they get them, because I have fewer answers than the bulk of them looking them up back there. Question two, how does, how does either C or D help solve the housing crisis? Um, that could be a very long answer. D has more housing than C. Primarily in this region, we have not only a housing shortage, we have a jobs housing imbalance. So you can also look at which one is going to bring in more people. Um, I suspect given the numbers that you can pretty much answer that. Okay, does the city of Cupertino have legal and enforceable ways to make sure that these community benefits are realized? Um, Measure D would become law and if voted into place by the voters and is therefore enforceable. Um, same question again, basically. 
Okay. Another question. I heard that Measure D will allow building height up to 144 feet, such as 95 feet for building and 25 feet for rooftop and 24 feet for a rooftop pavilion. Is this true? Research team, you didn't be, write an answer on that one. <laughs> I, I would have to research that one. Okay, Measure D, does it require or merely allow senior housing at Valco? It requires a minimum of 80 units or 20% of all units if there's a conditional use permit that would raise the number of residential units. Remember, we looked at that earlier, that it was 300 and... 389, but with a conditional use permit up to 800 units. Um, so 80 units or 20% of whatever do end up being built. Do you have more for me? I made it through the first stack. Measure D, where's the financing coming from? Sand Hill, Sand Hill property. Is there environmental impact study it's required to be done? I beg your pardon? Who finances Sand Hill? Um, I believe Sand Hill takes care of its own financing. Will traffic congestion get better? <laughs> I don't think we're taking philosophical questions. <laughs> there, will be, there will be more traffic, there will be traffic mitigation. Um, okay, and another question of doesn't 30 feet conform to 45 feet? Um, the court ru ruling casts this into doubt. I wouldn't say it's a definite no. Okay, Are, oh, you still have more. Okay, where do we learn what specific traffic mitigations outside of shuttle buses exist for Measure D? Um, Measure D requires a traffic mitigation plan. I don't know that it's actually been written yet. Ah, what areas are considered neighborhoods? Now's when I really wish we had a map to put up because the, uh, the city can supply that map. In fact, is that available on the city's website, do you know? Yes, it is. So if you go to the City of Cupertino website, you can see those areas sketched out. Easier to understand what we're talking about then. While we're passing the questions back and forth, I do want to take a moment to uh, thank the research team. You see the public part of this evening um, tonight. There's a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes as people are trying to dig out what does this mean? Um, what was the intent? How is it really going to play out? What's going to happen? What did happen in the courts? Um, and those people have put in a lot of work and they're still putting in a lot of work tonight. Are there more coming up or are we winding down here? Ah, I, I believe in taking time to write the answer. <laughs> ah, if Measure C passes and any changes have to be approved by voters, what is the average cost and time span to get a revision approved? The average cost per election is about $150,000. Um, you know, I'm a Sunnyvale person. I don't know um, in Cupertino how uh, easy it is to pull together an election for it, um, to put it on the next ballot. But it would, it, I don't think you'd want to do it on a special election. Okay. Looks like things are starting to wind down, in which case, I'm going to take you to the where to get more information and thank you for coming slide. <laughs> there are more materials out in the lobby, including some information on the state propositions. 
I, in the earlier segment, and again here, I'm going to point you to these, not so much on the local. They'll give you plenty of opportunity to learn more about the state things, the Easy Voter Guide, available for download in multiple languages, the League's pros and cons for a more detailed analysis. I think we're going to call this the last one. Uh, and we don't have the answer anyway. How do the office residential and commercial allotments in D compare to the allotments at Santana Row? We do not have that information, I'm sorry. Um, we want to, obviously we didn't answer all your questions tonight. And I'm sorry that we don't have all the answers, we never do. We're, we're not professionals at this, we're people like you who take an interest in learning as much as we can about this stuff and trying to do the right thing in our cities and our communities. And we hope that we together can do that, that we can learn the best way to make a just and equitable society together. And that, that's why we try to learn about these laws before we pass them or don't pass them. That's why we try to learn about the candidates before we elect them or vote against, the other, against them because the other guy looks a little better. The League was not formed to dictate to you what to do. We, we never support or oppose candidates or political parties. The League does sometimes take positions on ballot measures, but we're here from the education branch of the League tonight. We're not telling you anything about whether any of these measures are good or bad. We're trying to figure out what they will do if we vote them into place. And that's what we're here for. We're here to encourage informed and active participation in government and increase your understanding if you do think this is useful, lwvcs.org is our local league website. You can go to the calendar there, click on the link for this event. You'll be able to find a recording of it later, share with friends. You can also find our schedule for more presentations, including on the state propositions. And we've got 17 of those. So it's, it's just as well to find out a little more about them too. There are I already showed you the pros and cons in the Easy Voter Guide. I also recommend to you Voter's Edge. We've got the bookmarks for Voter's Edge. They have all about candidates, all about propositions. Well, they're gradually collecting all about candidates. The candidates have to put their information up on Voter's Edge. Propositions, they have a lot about the flow of money, which is very important on ballot measures for understanding who's really behind them and what they might do and wait a minute, how does that group have a stake in this proposition? And they, they have very comprehensive endorsement lists. They're, they're an excellent sort of one-stop shopping for voter information. But for all of you, thank you for putting the energy into this. Thank you for putting the time. We're all trying to understand this together. We're all trying to do the right thing together. And I'm really grateful to see this much time and intelligence and energy go into understanding this election and trying to do the right thing. Thank you very much for having us here, and good night. <laughs>